This video explains how to build an AI inference service that scales according to user demand. When there are many requests, we will rent more GPUs, and when there are fewer requests, we'll turn the GPUs off. In this way, you can most cost-effectively cater to fluctuating demand. If you're new to inference, I'll describe the basics of how to create an API endpoint for a single GPU. I'll then work my way through measuring demand and scaling, turning on and off GPUs accordingly. I'll discuss the economics of different approaches here. And then for more advanced users, I'll describe how to build Docker images for custom AI models. So for agenda, uh, three main parts to this video, I'll start by describing the different inference approaches. So the manual approach where you rent a fixed number of GPUs versus an auto scaling approach where you scale up and down how much you are renting. And I'll look at the cost comparison and trade-offs there. Then I'll describe how to set up one-click templates for running uh, AI models. And I'll talk in detail about how to set up Docker images. Now, generally there are off the shelf Docker images and they will provide the best performance. But if you have a custom model, in some cases, these aren't available and you have to build your own. So I'll quickly show that. And then I'll walk through building an auto scaling service. Now you can get auto scaling services out of the box. They're often called serverless from companies like say RunPod or Fireworks, but you can also build your own using an API for turning on and renting a GPU and then unrenting or turning it off uh, when you're done with it and you don't need it anymore. And this provides for some cost advantages and maybe some flexibility as well in how you want to run that inference service. By the end of the video, you should be able to deploy a full inference service, uh, including setting up an API endpoint that external users uh, can hit. And then all of the routing will be handled internally and distributed among the GPUs that you have rented. To start, let's look at the broad approaches. So there's the shared service approach which is how you're inferencing with OpenAI, Gemini, Anthropic, et cetera. Then on the other end of the scale, there's the fixed GPU rental. You just rent a fixed number of GPUs. And then kind of a halfway house here, there's the auto scaling or sometimes called the serverless approach where you're renting GPUs, but the number you rent, you scale according to the needs and according to the demand you have for those GPUs. Now uh, we'll get to this later, but the big benefit of a shared service is that you have many more customers using the same um, GPUs and so the utilization is really good and this allows those services to provide very low prices whereas if you are the only one using the GPUs whether that's a fixed number of GPUs or auto scaling it's much harder to fill up every request and make sure that the GPUs are always busy so your effective cost per token processed tends uh, to be quite a bit higher. Now, to understand the differences in pricing, we can think about this effective price uh, for rental, and I mean effective price per, say, million tokens of input. For example, we could consider renting a GPU at a dollar an hour. Maybe that's roughly the price of renting an A100 right now at the lower end of the scale. We can consider an average batch size of 16. So we've got 16 simultaneous requests at any moment in time. And let's consider a throughput of 100 tokens per second and that's input tokens in this case. Now, the throughput is going to depend radically on the size of the model that you're running. If you have smaller models, you're going to get a lot higher uh, token throughput. It will depend on the GPUs too. So I'm just doing one very basic example here that's not representative across the board. But if you run these numbers, you divide a dollar by the batch size, by the tokens per second and the seconds per hour, you come out to um, a cost per million input tokens here, uh, 17 cents. And you can see the effect of the batch size. So if you manage to keep your GPU busy with a very high average batch size, that's going to inversely proportionally reduce the cost uh, per token. Likewise, if you can get higher throughput, either by using better inference libraries um, or having a GPU that gives better inference per dollar of rental cost per hour, that's also going to help drive down your cost per token. Some notes here on auto scaling, because there are two main ways to do auto scaling. One is you can use an off-the-shelf or serverless type approach from companies like RunPod or Fireworks. And here they will manage and provide you with software so that the number of GPUs will scale up and down according to the number of requests. Now, when you use these auto-scaling services, typically the hourly rental cost of the GPUs is more expensive. For example, an A40 might be, uh, if it's 40 cents, you'd expect that the serverless rental cost will be maybe two to three times that. And there's a higher charge because you're paying uh, for that service and for the software that's provided with it. 
Now, the alternative is you can rent GPUs and turn them on and off via API uh, yourself if you have software to do that scaling. And that's something we're going to look at in this video. Just to emphasize the importance of GPU utilization, if you want to get low costs, I've drawn here a graph of price uh, on the y-axis, that's price per million input tokens, and then average batch size on the x-axis. And my average batch size goes from a batch size of one way up here, all the way to a batch size of 32. And I've drawn a few different lines. So I've got a line here for some shared service charging one uh, 10 cents per million tokens. That's the dash red line. Then I have an on-demand service charging 40 cents, uh, 40 cents per hour uh, on demand. And then I have the increased uh, price if using a serverless option where I'm paying, let's say $1 per hour. And so you can see that, uh, whereas you get this uh, steady price, regardless of usage on the shared service, um, you're only able to get down towards that price as you go to larger batch sizes, which means that you need to be uh, having high utilization of your server. And this is usually not trivial because demand typically fluctuates quite a bit during the day if you have some given user base. And so you'll often have periods where your servers are not being used that well, which uh, requires you then to do some kind of scaling. And so while you might pay more in theory uh, for serverless, what it allows you to do is make sure you operate at a larger batch size because you will just reduce the number of GPUs if your batch size gets too small. And so in practice, if you operate with serverless, you're probably able to operate over here. Whereas if you're just doing on demand and you're not auto scaling, you're going to be forced to have an average batch size that's really small and have a really high price uh, per million tokens processed. So here I've just put in some of the different numbers and uh, as a very rough representative case, maybe you've got 10 cents per million tokens on a shared service. If you then use an auto scaling service, provided you've enough demand to keep the batch size up around 16, you can maybe get to 17 cents. Um, whereas if you are doing fixed GPU rentals, well, either you're forced to have a very low batch size if you're just keeping the number of GPUs constant and you have a higher cost, or maybe if you build some software to have some auto scaling, you can get back to an average batch size of 16 and benefit from a lower cost. So this, uh, I'm repeating myself, but just to drive the message home, uh, my recommendations generally would be, ideally, you always want to use a shared service because this amortizes cost over more GPUs. The problem is if you have a custom model or a specific model, it may not be supported on a shared uh, service endpoint. Like maybe there's uh, some kind of a specialized coding model and it's on hugging face, but it's not available and being served uh, on demand. Second of all, in cases where you're fine tuning a model, um, it may not be straightforward to use a shared service either. There aren't many services right now where you can just bring your own LoRa adapter and run inference. Um, in some cases, you can do that with serverless type services, like I think with Firewalk works, but you can't do it. Um, at least I'm not aware of services where you can bring your own LoRa on a shared service, although I'm sure they'll pop up fairly soon. So that means if you're fine tuning a model or running an obscure custom model, then you're probably going to have to look at running either serverless or by renting your own GPUs. If you want a straightforward option for serverless, you can check out the video where I describe how to do that. Uh, but in this video, I'm going to talk through how you can build up your own scaling service uh, from scratch, where we'll turn on and off those GPUs. So that brings me to the uh, demonstration part of the video where I'll first describe how to set up one-click templates. I'll talk about Docker images as well, because they're core to setting up the inference service. And then I'll walk through how to build an auto-scaling service. Let's say you want to deploy a custom model and you're trying to set up a one-click template. Let's say you're trying to set up a custom model and you want to set up a one-click template. I'm going to look at deploying an endpoint here for the small LM 1.7B instruct model. But you can imagine starting off on any hugging face page uh, with some kind of model. Perhaps it's even a fine tune. So the first thing I'm going to do is head to RunPod. And you'll need to have created an account. I've put the affiliate link below if you'd like to support the Trellis channel. And I'm going to go to Templates and click on New Template and give it a template name. So here we're going to be looking at uh, small LM2. 
And I'm going to just say small lm instruct by trellis research. Okay. Next, I need to decide on a few of these parameters here. So I'm going to need some kind of container image. This is a Docker image that will uh, contain a library for running inference on the server. And I'm going to need to pass in some container start commands and then do some sizing of the container disk and the volume. Um, I'll also need to update the volume mount path and set some environment variables. So there's a few things I'll have to do here and I'm going to go through them uh, one by one. Something I think is helpful is if you go to the one-click LLM's repo, this is a public repo, and just click on any model, uh, a text model is best because here we're trying to inference a text model. So I'm going to take the Llama 3 8B model. Um, what you can do is just go to this template, pick a GPU, and then look at the template for it. So I'll, I'll just randomly pick a GPU. I'm not going to deploy. And I'm going to say edit. And here I'm going to be able to see the values and make use of those in the template I'm trying to build for small LM. So working top to bottom, the first thing I need to decide on is a container image. And here there are, it has to be a Docker image and there are a few options. One option is going to be VLLM. Another one is maybe to run SGLang. You could also run a text generation inference from Hugging Face. Now the most commonly used one is probably VLLM. SGLang I think has got particular benefits for large batch sizes. It maintains very high speed, so I wouldn't uh, overlook that either. But uh, for a straightforward approach today, I'm going to stick with the VLLM uh, Docker image. So I need the address of that container image on uh, Docker, and I can get that either by looking at this other template I have, or I can get it by going to the VLLM repo on GitHub, and I can find if there's a Docker file, and then I can probably search on Docker Hub for VLLM uh, Docker images. But since I can get this easily from the template, I'm going to go and copy this over right here. Now, VLLM is the organization on Docker Hub. This is the name of the Docker image. And then latest just means it will automatically get the latest version. Now, if you are going to run this in production, you may not want to run in latest. You may want to fix it to a specific tag um, because if there are changes in the API that don't uh, maintain backward compatibility, then you could run into trouble unexpectedly. Uh, so what you can do is you can go on to uh, just search for Docker, VLLM, and then VLLM OpenAI, and let's see if we find anything. So here we've got uh, that exact uh, repo on Docker Hub, and you can see in the tags that we're currently on uh, this latest tag here. So alternatively, if I wanted to fix the tag, I could... Uh, Instead of choosing latest, I could put in the latest, uh, the version here. So I think it would just be um, something like this. But I am going to keep latest and move forward. The next thing is uh, the container start command. And again, it's easiest if you just look at an existing template to figure out what you want to put here. The key things are you need to pass in the model name and you need to pass in then, you don't have to pass in the max model length. It will just default to a value, but you could run out of uh, VRAM, so it can be an idea to just put that in, especially if you're happy with the smaller max model length. And then you do need to put in uh, this port number here. The port is going to ensure that that is exposed. So basically VLLM and also SGLang, they will run the service on port 8000, and you need to make sure that that port is going to be externally exposed so that requests coming into the server are able to hit it. So you'll see port 8000 needs to be here, that tells VLLM, okay, we're going to run on port 8000. And then we also need to expose the port via the HTTP ports, HTTP ports uh, box over here. So I'm going to copy this and paste it back in here. And then I'm going to copy uh, the model slug. It needs to be slug and paste it here. And everything else I'm going to keep the same, except I need to expose my port here. Now, there's one other thing that you need to be sure of uh, at this point, and that's that VLLM actually supports this model, uh, this model here. Uh, so how do you find that out? Well, one option is you can go to the VLLM repo and you can search in the issues and you can see if people have got any issues with running that specific model. And if they do, either it might be a work in progress or it might be supported. Um, 
Generally, any straightforward Llama architectures are going to be supported because the Llama model is supported. And I think that's the case here with small LM. So that's why I'm betting this is going to work when I try to run the model. And it may not because I haven't tried this yet. So working down, we've next got to set uh, the container disk and the volume. So starting with the volume, this is the hard drive that it's going to uh, have the weights downloaded. So we need to know the size of the weights. You can literally look at the size of the weights by checking the files and looking for the safe tensors. So here it looks like we need at least 3.42 plus a little bit of spare. Uh, alternatively, you can kind of use a rule of thumb. If the model is in 16 bits, that means there's eight by eight bits per byte. So it's going to be two, um, it's going to be two bytes and every parameter is, if it's stored in 16 bits, that means every parameter out of the 1.7 billion parameters is going to be two bytes. So you just multiply by two and that will give you a rough number plus add a little bit spare. So here I'm going to do uh, 3.4 plus some spare is five gigabytes and the container. Um, this is the size of the Docker container. Typically, I like to make this larger than the largest shard that is being downloaded. So the model in this case is actually just one shard. It's all in one file, but often if it's a very big model, it'll be split into multiple different shards. And so you need, uh, I like to have the container larger than what the largest shard is. So here the largest shard is 3.42. So I'm just going to make that five as well. Next there's, um, the volume mount path, by the way, we don't need to set credentials here. Um, you could have credentials for Docker hub, but this is if it's a private Docker image and typically the images are public, so you don't need to put in credentials. Next is the volume mount path. So I'm going to just copy that, uh, from my other image. And this ensures that the weights get downloaded, uh, to the cache and to hugging face. It's good to set this because it means when you run the pod, it's going to download the weights there and it'll be able to refine them if you restart the pod. So it won't just re-download the weights again, which is something that will cost you time if you have to restart the pod. Um, so with that, you can decide if it's public or private. There are some environmental variables that you can set here. For example, if this is a gated repo, you need to set HF token and you need to go to your hugging face tokens page. So, uh, this page here, get a token. It can be a read token and then paste it back in. This model is public though, so I don't need to do that. However, there is, um, another variable HF hub enable HF transfer. This allows for fast rust downloads of the weights. Um, it may, I don't think it's automated on VLLM, although I'm not entirely sure it might be automated, but I like to just put it in, in case it makes sure that we get fast weight, uh, downloads. So I'll omit, leave, I'll omit writing the readme for now and just save the template. And now I'm going to go to, uh, pods and I'm going to, um, deploy. So this is one I have, uh, deployed from earlier. I can just close that down and let's deploy a new pod. So we deploy on an A40 and let's change the template to use the small LM. So we've got this template here and I'm going to deploy on demand. The first thing that will happen is the container will get downloaded from Docker. And once the container is downloaded, it will start to run the installation inside the container. So you can check the system logs here to see the status of the container down. Um, and then once the image router, the image download and extraction. And once that's all done, you'll be able to see what's happening inside the container. So while I'm waiting, actually, I will try to improve the template on, uh, improve the readme. So let's go back and find small LM and edit this. And in the readme, let's do small LM inference. And we're going to use an open AI endpoint. So we can just do VLLM open AI, and that will find the docs on open AI endpoints. So here's the chat completion client. And this is uh, the code that we could run. So. We're going to copy this code and we can uh, run inference with this. And there's one change here because we're actually going to hit run pod instead of hitting uh, the open AI endpoint or rather hitting our local host because we're running on um, local host. So the way we do that, we're running on run pod. The way we do that is by searching for the run pod proxy. So here, um, I need to find the run pod proxy in the docs. And run pod allows you to 
uh, query this specific endpoint here. So if we've exposed 8,000, we'll be able to hit that pod uh, endpoint, that pod port by using this command here. So I've copied that and let's just paste it here. And I'm going to replace now this and the internal port is going to be 8,000 because that's what we've set. Uh, so everything looks good here now. And we have some questions. Um, I'm not sure I need to have that many questions. So let's just reduce it to ask one. And I think now I can check what this looks like. So we have this little script and we can uh, run that script now once our pod is up and running. So I'll save the template. Now I'll go back to the pod and see the status. Let's see uh, how things are running. I need to go back to my pods and check the logs here. And you can see everything has worked because um, everything is up and running on port 8000. So what I'm going to do now is just uh, in a terminal here, I'm just going to make a directory called test inference and I'll make a VN uh, using UV and do UV pip install open AI um, because I need that. And next I'm going to touch inference.py and I'm going to put in that little code snippet that uh, we have for uh, inferencing this API endpoint. So this is just copied from the readme and we need to make a few changes here. We've got the pod up and running. So I'm going to go and get the pod ID uh, from here. So I've got the pod ID and there's one other thing we need, which is to specify the correct model name. Um, so model here is also, actually it's been requested from uh, the list of models and the zeroth model. So this is a nice automated way of just getting uh, the model results. Control C, Y, oops, Control X, or Command X, Y, and then enter. And I can now run UV run inference.py and this should hit the 8,000 endpoint. So here we have uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers won the World Series in 2020 in the American League West uh, champions. And so that's um, that's the simple setup of uh, running a template and you can see how I created the readme. Now, just a few quick comments um, on little modifications that you might want to make. Generally, if you want to have faster inference, there are two ways to get faster inference. One is to pick a faster model, so or a faster GPU. So rather than picking an A40, you could pick an A100 or even more, you could pick a H100. Uh, the second way that you can get faster inference is when you're deploying, you can deploy multiple GPUs. So you could choose an A40 and then pick two or four. Now it's not true that you can just infinitely increase the GPUs because when you use multiple GPUs for inference, you can get some lag between the GPUs, but generally you will find speed up and you will be able to uh, process more input context if you increase the number of GPUs. So that's something you'll see later when I get to the auto scaling. And by the way, if you do use multiple GPUs, uh, the way to pass that into VLLM is by setting a uh, tensor parallel and you need to set that to however number many of GPUs that you have. And let me just quickly check in the docs for VLLM, check that this flag does indeed exist. And yeah, it's actually tensor parallel size. So I need to go back and change that. So it would just be tensor parallel size and then equals to the number uh, of GPUs that you want. So this is pretty much uh, inference and how to set up the endpoints uh, just in a simple way. There's no scaling involved here. You're just going to hit the endpoint and that means that your utilization will be bad if you have few requests. Also, if you get a ton of requests, you may not be able to service them very quickly. Uh, VLLM will batch them and they'll just be slowly delivered. So you'll find that inference gets kind of slow if you have a fixed number of GPUs. So the next way to improve upon this is I'm going to programmatically start up GPUs by using the RunPod API. So I'll be able to rent a GPU and then return it if I don't need it anymore. And I'll set up an algorithm to check uh, what, the lin what the inference speed is. And if the speed falls below a threshold, I'll use that to run another pod. So here's the approach for auto scaling. RunPod has an API. It allows us to turn on and off pods. So we're going to 
do that, I'll start by just building a script that literally turns on a pod for a specific model and then turns it off and deletes it. Then I'll create a script that checks when the pods are fired up by hitting it with a quick inference request. And once that inference request returns properly, I'll mark the pod as ready. Then I will do some load testing. So this is where we'll barrage the a GPU, just one GPU for now, or maybe two or three, but only one pod. We'll barrage the pod with a lot of requests and see what the token response times are. And that will allow us to set some thresholds for the minimum tokens per second and the maximum that we want. And in the next part, we will auto scale based on those min and maximum thresholds. So if the tokens per second, the server measures and we'll have to set up a measurement script goes below a threshold, it will fire up more servers, more pods. And if it goes uh, above, then it will close down pods. And finally, then I'll show you how to deploy all of this as um, an endpoint. So we'll wrap all of this service so that you can then just hit a single endpoint and all of the routing will happen uh, internally. And where I'm going to work out of is the advanced inference repository. So this is uh, a private repository, trellis research forward slash advanced uh, inference. You can get access if you go to trellis.com, that's T-R-E-L-I-S.com forward slash advanced inference, and you can purchase lifetime access. This has a wide variety of inference scripts and techniques around fact checking, Monte Carlo, uh, redacting private information, sampling, security. Um, you can see a whole list if you go to the Trellis website, but we're going to be working out of the server and API setup folder and then server scaling. And I'm going to git clone this repo now and I'll work out of VS code or cursor, but I have the whole server set up here uh, inside the server scaling folder. So here I am in VS code or actually I'm in cursor and I'm in the serving scaling folder that I just mentioned. And you can check out the readme here. Uh, for full instructions on how to do this. You will need to set up uh, a RunPod account and you'll need to get an API key. So over on RunPod, you can just go to your settings. So go into uh, RunPod, your organization. And if you go to, uh, let's see where it is. Yep, here we go. And then settings, you'll be able to find API key um, just down here. So create an API key and you want to add that into your environment variables as RunPod API key. So that's in my environment variables here. Then you want to create a, a virtual environment. Uh, I've been doing that with UV recently. So UV VN, and then you can activate the virtual environment if you want, and then pip install the requirements that are going to be needed. Now, the first script I said is going to be one for just turning on and off pods, and it's called pod.py. And there are a few different functions uh, this allows you to do. So it's going to allow you to start up a pod for a given model, uh, shut down a pod, and also list uh, the active pods, and also delete all of the pods. And the whole way that this works is built on a model configuration. So within the utilities, I've got model models config, uh, model configs, and I've set some configurations uh, for this uh, scaling tool. And there has to be a configuration for every model because every model is going to have some different settings. So for example, here, I have the Llama 3.2 uh, 1B instruct model, and I'm going to walk through now some of the different configurations we'll meet as we go through the scripts. So first of all, I have a model name that I'll refer to if I want to start up a service for this model. Next, I have capabilities, uh, which can include for now text or uh, text plus uh, vision. So you'll see for the Quen VL 2B instruct model, um, I've put in capabilities of text and also text plus image, which means I'll be able to inference them either using images or text or both. Next is the Docker arguments. The Docker arguments is the same thing we put in the box. You'll remember when we set up the one click templates. So it has the model here and it also has that port number. We're exposing port 8,000. There is one more argument and this is where VLLM allows you to basically set a name for the model you're serving. By default, the name will just be the Hugging Face slug if you're pulling from Hugging Face. But if you want the name to just be the name of the model and not the full slug, you can set it using this served model name here. Next, we have to set the volume in gigabytes. That's the volume of the hard disk. So it needs to be bigger than the weights. Um, so for a 1B model, I needed to be at least probably 2 billion uh, to, to be 2 gigabytes in size. Next, we're going to set the minimum and maximum instances. So this is relevant for scaling. 
uh, I'm going to say that at all times, I want there to be one instance running and I want to allow scaling up to a max of three instances, although you can, you can increase that or you could decrease it. Next, we have the maximum uh, tokens per second. This is the number of output tokens per second, which is the common way we think about tokens per second, and then uh, the maximum. And these, are need, these will need to be adjusted during a load test because we'll figure out what a reasonable minimum and maximum will be for a given GPU and for a given model. Next, we're going to decide on GPUs per instance. Um, this is a lever to increase the token generation speed. So by having multiple GPUs in the one instance and using tensor parallel, you can get faster inference. Uh, so you can use this as a lever if you just want to increase the tokens per second. The trade-off is if uh, you increase this, you're paying for more uh, GPUs because you're probably going to have a minimum of one instances running all the time. And if you have two GPUs per instance, that means you have a minimum of two GPUs running all the time, which is going to probably on average increase your costs. The next uh, parameter here is scaling cooldown. So this here basically uh, will affect the rate at which we scale GPUs. And what it says is, if we decide to turn on a GPU, we're not going to turn on another instance, broader, I should say instance, not GPU. We're not going to turn on another instance until this cooldown period has elapsed. Uh, and the reason we want to cool down is because we don't want the system to just turn on GPUs over responsively. So it might see that tokens per second are going down. It thinks it should turn on a GPU. We don't want a new GPU to keep going on. We want there to be some cooldown period to smooth things out. So this cooldown applies both when, a cheap, when an instance is uh, added or when an instance is taken away. We're not going to do any more changes until the cooldown period has elapsed. Generally, this should be at least as long as the time it takes to boot up a new GPU so that there's enough time to see the benefit of another instance coming online. Uh, so if you have a smaller model, it's going to be faster to boot. If you have a larger model, you probably need a larger cooldown time. And also your system is overall going to be less responsive. Next, we have uh, a metrics window. This is the number of seconds in the past over which we will measure the tokens per second. Uh, so we're going to look at the average tokens per second over the last 60 seconds. You can uh, have a more stable system by making this longer. So you could look at the average tokens per second over the last five minutes and use that as a basis for scaling up or down, but then it's going to be less responsive. So you need to adjust this according to how responsive you want your system to be. And last of all, we have a monitoring interval. This is how frequently we're going to check to either scale up or scale down the GPUs. And I've set it currently uh, to an interval of 15 seconds. So you can see for every model, and currently I've got uh, Quen VL2B uh, and 7B. Actually, this one here, I think, is just a replica. So that's probably unnecessary. I think I can probably just delete that. Uh, and then I have 7B down there. So I can just delete uh, this applicated 2B model. And I've got 7B, 2B, and then I've got a Lama 3.21B instruct. So with these configurations, I'm going to define some functions now for turning on GPUs. And first of all, I'll just look at turning on and off GPUs with pod.py. Then I'm going to do some load checking. So I'll walk through a load script so we can set some reasonable values for min and max TPS. And then last of all, I'm going to walk through a scaling manager script. Uh, the scaling manager will allow us, based on tokens per second, to turn on or turn off more GPUs. So very quickly, um, let's look at the pod.py script. And I'll walk through a few functions. This is just a formatting function uh, for time. Um, but here we have a delete pod function. So um, this is going to call the run pod API and delete uh, a given pod. We have a list of availables, available GPUs. So this, you can just run in the terminal to see what types of GPUs, like A40, A6000, A100. And that's important so you know which GPUs you want to start up on. And on that point, uh, you're going to see where we define the GPUs that we want to turn on. We'll see that in pod utilities in a moment. Uh, then we have the main uh, function for pod.py. Um, it's just going to check for some flags. So depending on whether we want to start a pod, stop a pod, check the status, list all of the pods that are running, delete all the pods, delete all the pods for a given model, um, sync the database. So we're going to have a database that tracks whether the pods are ready for inference. 
I'll talk about that in a moment. And we will need to uh, regularly sync the database to make sure that if pod, a pod has been deleted, say from the run pod UI, we need it to be deleted from the database as well. And that tells us it's not available. And then we have the list uh, GPUs function here. And then we have some other parameters that allow us to uh, start a model of a given name, uh, start a given volume, uh, size, uh, certain Docker arguments. Basically, all of these arguments allow us to overwrite uh, the configs that we have set in the config file. But I would recommend just setting the configurations in model configs and not overriding here. So let's um, quickly just show some of these commands because it's the easiest way to describe the script. And you can check out possible commands just by looking in the readme file. Uh, so we'll start and I'm in the sc server scaling for folder and let's list out the GPUs. So I'll run list GPUs. And here, if I just minimize, you can see we have a range of GPUs available uh, and the prices you can check on RunPod, it's not actually coming through as I've currently got it set up, but you can see we have everything, uh, probably well over 20 different GPUs that are available for rental. So what you would do next is you would decide, well, what are the GPUs that I want to preferentially use according to whether they're available? And then I'm going to set those within my utilities, uh, specifically in uh, pod utilities here. So if I, um, let me just clear that there. You can see I've set a variable called GPU preferences within pod utilities. And the preference stack I have is I'm going to start and try and run this uh, cheap GPU here, the A40. If that's not available, I'll try run a 4500. If that's not available, an A500. And if that's not available, an RTX 3090. So when we start up GPUs, uh, we're going to try and start up GPUs in that order uh, according to the preferences I've set. And if you wanted to change that, you would just check the available GPUs here and swap in uh, the names from this table into your GPU preference stack here. So next, um, we're going to list all running pods. So let me run that command and there should be none running uh, because I've closed everything down. So yeah, you can see, actually there is one running. It looks like we're still running the small LM. It looks like we're still running the small LM pod. So let's go up and check if that matches what's on. Um, yeah. And that's true. So we are running small LM and you can see that there's a LAMA 3.21 B model that was terminated. And that's true too, because I terminated it earlier on. So before we start a new pod, let's actually delete all the pods. So I'm going to run uh, the delete all command and that uh, should leave everything closed. So now if I list my GPUs, I should see, uh, yeah, there's no pods in the database and there's no pods running. So next I'm going to start up, um, a Quen VL 2B model. So UV run pod.py start and start up this model. And you can see when it starts, it will print out, uh, the ID and some other attributes. Uh, it's actually printing out my hug and face token, um, because I'm passing that in, in case there are gated models. So I'll have to just uh, delete that model now, <laughs> or I'll have to delete that. Uh, hugging face token. It is needed by the way, if I'm running the llama model. So that's why I pass it in. And you can see also the environment variable for the HF hub enable HF transfer is passed in too. So what I should see now, if I go across to run pod is that the model has started and indeed it has. So this model is now loading and you should also see that the Docker arguments are, are passed. So you have the served model name and uh, the model here, the port and Actually for image uh, models, I'm also passing in, in the Docker argument, this uh, limit of multimodal images uh, per prompt. So I'm limiting that to uh, four. And that matches exactly what I've set in the model configs. So if I go down to the Quen model, you'll see set the limit here. Now there is also one other parameter that's automatically being set and that's the tensor parallel size. If you decide to have uh, more than one GPU here, it will automatically append um, in the pod utils, the tensor parallel size, so we can actually see that, um, happening here. So the tensor parallel size is set to the number of GPUs, for instance, and if that number is greater than one, then we will add that into the Docker arguments to make sure that we have the correct number of tensors in parallel. Okay. So next, uh, we are going to check the status of that pod. It's going to take a little bit of time to start up. We can see it's extracting. And the question now is. Once the pod is up and running, 
how do we know that it's actually accepting requests? And for, the, for that, we need to send in a short request and see that it responds with tokens. And once that is the case, we can mark in our database that the pod is available uh, for doing inference. So I'm going to show you now uh, the inference script. And in fact, inference script will call on inference utils. And it's going to allow us to run a command called test inference. And what the test inference does is it takes in a model name and it will then make a short request here saying, say test, if you can hear me, and it will just allow for 10 response tokens. And based on that, it's going to return true if this request works and it's going to return false otherwise. And when it returns true, it should mark the model as being available in a database. So actually, if I list my pods now, what I should see is that there is a pod available, um, but it's not ready. And it's not ready because it's still booting up. So if we check here, it is indeed going to be uh, still booting up. But once this is ready, and it actually is almost ready now, when we run the list command again, it's going to uh, check and it should be marked as uh, active. So you can see it's running now. If I run again this uh, list command, What's actually happening is we're making this request to test that the inference is active. And because that test has now passed, we're now going to get uh, the pod status as being ready. So that's a quick demo of how we can now uh, start up pods. We can delete pods. Uh, we can list the pods that are active. And we also have a way to know that the pods are ready. And that is pretty much the toolkit we need to be able to now start building a scaling service. But uh, first, we need to be able to measure how fast the inference is, because that's what we're going to use to determine whether to scale up or down. And so for that, um, I've got an inference script that allows us to inference in a few different ways. And here, if you look at the main function, there are three different types of inference we're going to allow. So the first will be uh, a load test. So if we pass in a load test argument, we're going to hit the API endpoint uh, rather, we're going to hit the model and actually we're going to hit all of the pods that are running that model with a certain number of requests per second. So we'd set a batch size and we'd set a duration over which to run uh, that test for. Uh, the second type of test will be a speed test. This is just a single inference. So we're just putting in one request, measuring how fast it is. And then the last or default type of inference will be just a simple request where you can control the prompt or you can control the prompt and image in the case of the vision model. So let's run a few different types of inference. And again, I'll look through the readme here. We're not going to run the scaling service just yet. So we've just got one uh, pod that's running. And we can start off by asking this question here, uh, what is AI? And you can see we've got back this response here. So that seems to be working well. Now the next one is the speed test. Um, in fact, if you want, we can run a quick vision test here. This is just passing up an image uh, that has the trellis uh, logo in it. So we'll see what it says. Yeah, it's a blue handwritten script that appears to be the letter T. So that's working well. And then we have the speed test. So here we're going to just see how fast it's able to generate 250 tokens and then get the stats. And it looks like time to first token is six seconds. Tokens generated 238. Um, tokens per second is 85.69. So that's our inference speed. And uh, next we're going to run the load testing. So load testing is important because it gives us a sense of the heaviest amount of inference we're going to have and allows us to size the minimum tokens per second and maximum in the config file. So I'm going to run inference on this model using a load test. And we're going to test it um, with 64 concurrent requests. So there'll always be 64 requests uh, over a period of 30 seconds. So let's uh, paste that in here. And yeah, you can check out the load testing file here if you're interested. It's uh, easiest to probably check through the main, um, or rather there is no main function here because we're just calling it. But we have the option to uh, run a single speed test and return the metrics, or we have the option to run a full load test, which is what we're doing now. And it's going to check that we have uh, pods available. 
uh, we'll check all of the pods available and it's going to distribute the requests across those pods using a load balancer. Now I'll show the load balancer script later, but load balancer is simply randomly sending requests to the available pods that are ready for inference. So it's getting, um, it's getting the pod ID, uh, to make sure that we have at least one working pod. It's setting up uh, the time because we want to measure how fast we can inference. And then we have a thread pool X here that's going to allow us to run um, 64 parallel requests in this case. And so we're going to start hitting the endpoint with those parallel requests and then recording uh, the times as things come back in. And we're interested critically in the tokens per second of output. We're also going to measure the time to the first token, which we can do because we're streaming. And when we're streaming, we just measure the time until we get that first token. And then we measure the total time until the final token is delivered to measure our inference in terms of tokens per second. And the metrics we give back will be the minimum tokens per second, the maximum, the average uh, across all of the requests. We'll also record the average time to first token, uh, which I'll call latency in other places, and then P5. So this is basically how many tokens per second uh, are 95% of the requests above. So if we want to have high confidence we're above a certain threshold, this is kind of the threshold we can think of that our system is able to deliver. So here, when we've run those 64 requests, we've got the results. We did a total of uh, 256 requests. Uh, the average tokens per second was uh, 36.7, minimum 21, maximum 55, and the P5 uh, was 25. So 95% requests are faster than 25 tokens per second, and the timed first token is uh, two seconds. So the key thing here is I'm going to go now to my model configs file and I'm going to set the value for the minimum TPS. And this refers to the average. So we're saying if the average ever drops below this value, it's going to scale up and the average ever goes above this value, it's going to scale down. Uh, so that's why I need to look here at what my average TPS is. And here it's at 36.7. So I'm going to set that uh, to my maximum. And then for the minimum. You can set this somewhere below, maybe set it 50% below or 30% below. I'll set it maybe to um, 25 or just, uh, yeah, 25 tokens for the moment. Now here at this point, if your tokens per second are not fast enough, that means either you need to swap your GPUs to something more powerful. So in the pod utils, you need to pick more powerful GPUs and or you need to increase the number of GPUs per pod. Uh, so I could do that here. In fact, I was running on two. That's why my values were higher with just one instance though. Um, these are the settings. If I want to have higher tokens per second, yeah, I should try rerunning with two and then go back, measure and update these values right here. So with that, I've now set um, the parameters that are going to help us to dynamically turn on and off GPUs. Now, just very quickly, we'll take a quick look. Uh, we'll take a look at the load balancer. This is how we're distributing uh, our request between the GPUs. So we have a function that's going to get available pods. It's going to check that the pods are ready. And then it's going to uh, select a pod just by taking a random choice from the available pods. And this sprays the requests across uh, the available GPUs. Now there are probably more advanced methods. In fact, there are where you should be uh, combining ones of similar length or strategies like that. But a random strategy is not too bad to start. And then we're going to record metrics. So it's important that um, we have the metrics of any inference requests that are being made, because ultimately that's what's going to dictate whether we should be increasing or decreasing the number of pods that we're using. So next we're going to move to the scaling manager. And this is the code that allows us to turn on another pod or turn off a pod if we go above a certain number of tokens per second. Now I'll very quickly go through this because it's easier to understand it when I just run commands on the command line. You would think of setting up a scaling ma uh, manager for a given model. So we'll have a manager for a given model name. And there will be a few functions. So there'll be a function to get um, a list of ready pods. So if there are pods that are already running, the manager will take that into account. If there aren't any pods running, it will already start up the minimum number of pods as you've specified in the model configs. Then there's a should scale function. This will look at the tokens per second and decide to scale up or down the number of GPUs. And you can see that will call either a scale up, which will just call on a new available pod. It will call to generate a new available pod or scale down, which will remove a pod and clean it up. 
Uh, this is the ensure minimum pods function, which does exactly as you would think. And then there's the monitoring loop. So every 15 seconds, as I've currently set it in the model configs, it's going to check um, what is the TPS. So what's the tokens per second? How does that compare to what the minimum and the maximum are? And then run should scale. So we'll decide whether we should scale up or down and take those actions accordingly. So we're going to use the readme file in order to uh, run the scaling. And quite simply, it's just UV run scaling service, then the model name. And you can add the debug flag at the end if you want to see some extra logging of what's going on. So let's uh, take a look through what's happening. We're starting the scaling surface for Quen VL. Uh, it's printing out the model configuration that we've set. And now it's going to start the monitoring loop. It's going to synchronize uh, with our database. Our database just tra tracks which pods are ready by running a quick test on the pod. And it's noticed that we already have a pad pod that's running and it's already so we've got one running and one ready. So that one is ready and the minimum required is one. So it means that we're in good shape. We don't need to scale up uh, any pods. Now there are no requests that have been made over the last 60 seconds, the monitoring window. So you can see the TPS is our zero. And so the decision here is that there's no uh, scaling that's going to be needed. So now it's uh, sleeping for 15 seconds and then it's going to go up and check again what the TPS is. And because I'm not inferencing, there's uh, no TPS, so it's going to just stay steady uh, with one pod. Now, what I can do is I can run um, some commands here to get some scaling going. And the way I can do that is I can run a load test and I can run a pretty heavy load test that's going to result in low um, tokens per second. And if I have low tokens per second, it's going to trigger it uh, to scale up. So let's uh, run a load test that's going to be pretty heavy. I can do that um, with this command here. And yeah, rather than running um, 64, that's actually run with 128. So we try and put a pretty heavy load on the system. And what we should see now uh, in the monitoring is after 15 seconds, it's going to pick up a fairly low TPS. And with the low TPS, it's going to go below the minimum threshold. And that should start up uh, a new pod. And so, yeah, you can see that's already happening here. Uh, the average TPS is now coming in. And actually, the TPS is still uh, pretty good. So it looks like we're able to maintain what we need with that uh, one pod. And you can see the results of my load test here. Actually, my TPS is still uh, quite high. Uh, it's not really that high, but it's just because my it's at 28 and it's able to maintain that pretty well, even on a very large number of requests. Um, so it's actually hard for me to trigger here to uh, something that's too slow in terms of generation. And yeah, and that's just because I've already set a fairly low TPS for what's a pretty small model. Um, so what probably would have been more realistic is if I'd have run uh, a load test, I maybe should have set my benchmark uh, based on something like uh, 32. So if I run a test at 32, so you can see uh, coming through here, um, we're able to get maybe 45. 45. So I'm going to fix this to, uh, to 45 and then I'll put this lower bound. I'll put it at something a bit high so that I uh, try to force some kind of trigger. And I'm going to turn off my scaling service and restart it just so that it picks up uh, the model configs here. So I've restarted my scaling service and let's go back and run another load test. And this time, uh, yeah, we can run the load test at 64. So we're simulating an increased load here. And this should drag my tokens per second down below what we've set in the model configs of uh, 34.0. And I have indeed uh, done that for the correct model, which is good. And you can see the average uh, tokens per second are 37 right now. So we're actually still managing to stay uh, within the threshold. So I'll just increase that a little bit more. Uh, try and push ourselves over the threshold or under the threshold rather. And keep in mind, this is a very small model. So our, our totals, uh, tokens per second is very high um, because we're able to just inference a lot even on this A40 GPU. So now we have finally gone below the threshold of 35. And so it's made a decision to scale up. And so now there's a new pod that's being created. And uh, the readiness check has failed because it's still booting, which makes sense. And we're going to start a cool down now 
So we're not going to be able to start up any new pods until the cool down period is expired. Uh, you can see here, we still have 162 seconds in the cool down and we're waiting for another pod to be ready. And if we go across to run pod, we can see now there are two pods and the second pod here is uh, just getting going now. And shortly, uh, shortly that should be up and running as well. So yeah, you can see the model is up and running and there are two pods that are ready. And if we run that same request again, the heavy request, um, we should be better able to manage that heavy request because we have uh, the higher throughput. Yeah, and so here you can see we're now running with a very high TPS, uh, 10,000 tokens per second, and we're able to maintain uh, the level of TPS that we require. In fact, are we, we're not going over the max TPS, so it's going to stay where it is. But you can see as an illustration, um, this is how we've got two pods up and running. And if I stop inferencing now, that TPS is going to go down to, to zero after uh, 60 seconds, because that's what we've currently set the monitoring window to. And if we get to that point, then it's going to decide to scale down a GPU because uh, we won't need it in order to maintain uh, the demand that we require. Once you have your scaling service up and running, any inference requests you make, and you can run inference requests using uh, these commands here, they will all be routed through the load balancer and go to whichever pods are ready. And furthermore, the metrics will be recorded that can then be used to guide the scaling of the service up and down. But if you're running this for a custom model, you might also want to expose a single API endpoint that either you or your customers can make use of. And the easiest way to do that is to set up a fast API. Fast API is a nice approach because uh, it can allow you to provide documentation uh, pretty much automatically once you build the API endpoints. And so I've set up um, a fast API service. It's in the API folder here. So if you open that folder, you can check out uh, the main components. It runs off of uh, a main.py script, uh, which is going to set up uh, the key endpoints that you want to use. And the way you can run the server is you want to get into write folder first. So CD into server and API setup, and then CD into server scaling, and then uh, API. And once you're in that folder, you can start the service. Um, you can run it on whatever port you want. Uh, here I'm running it on uh, 8080. And actually, this should be UV run, uh, UV corn, if you're going to use UV, which I am because I want to use um, the environment that has everything installed. And let's just see if I'm... Uh, and actually, I don't, I don't want to be in the API folder. I want to be in the server scaling folder. And I can run that command. And everything should be up and running. And if you just go to that uh, endpoint, it won't display anything except if you go to docs. So that should bring you up automatically a set of API documents. You can also type in redoc here and get a redoc version of the API. Um, and now you should be able to run the endpoint. So for example, I can try out the models endpoint. And if I execute that command, it will show me, um, it will show me that the Quen model here is available. Alternatively, I can run the chat completions endpoint. This is an open AI style endpoint that accepts either text only or text plus image chat completion. I'm going to try it out. Uh, so it's provided me with a demo here and it's got uh, the right model. And it's going to send in this image uh, from Quen and ask what's shown in the image. So I can execute that command and that's going to now generate uh, an output. Uh, which is provided here. So it provides a logo uh, for Quen and a little bit of description. So yeah, now you can just hit this endpoint in OpenAI style. You can get some sample commands and adjust them. Uh, something I will uh, note as important is that the inference speed also depends on the type of model. So if you're trying to inference with, with images versus you're inferencing just with text, you're going to have different uh, token generation speeds. So that all needs to be carefully set up when you're going to set the thresholds uh, for scaling your service up and down. And also very important to set the maximum and minimum instances, just because if your scaling does either go to the top or to the bottom, you want to make sure that at least your costs are going to be bounded in those worst cases. And just very briefly, how this API endpoint works, quite simply, it sets up an OpenAI style endpoint that takes in requests, and then it takes those requests off the back end and it sends them uh, to the load balancer 
and that load balancer is then distributing the queries amongst the pods. So we've basically wrapped all of the scaling service uh, into a single front end API that you can use either yourself or for your customers. And that's my overview of how you can build an auto scaling uh, service for inferencing your models. There's one point that I didn't cover today. I'll consider covering it in a later video. Uh, you can let me know in the comments if it's of interest. And that point is around models that are not supported by say VLLM or SGLang or TGI. What are you supposed to do in that case? Well, the answer is you need to develop your own API and you need to convert it into a Docker image that you can then insert into the template or into your calls to set up a pod, say on RunPod. So I'll go through that on a later date if there's interest. Uh, for now, if you have any questions on what choice you should make, whether you should go serverless or whether you should do the scaling yourself or simply rent a single GPU, you can let me know in the comments. Cheers, folks.